here's how I thought we'd do it. I'll just do a little introduction to the, to the idea. We'll have Carl, who's uh, done an enormous work on the commons, enormous amount of work on the commons and sort of the rights of property. Guy, after that, who's also done uh, a lot of work on the more recent origins of the commons, like a thousand years old. Uh, after that, Nam Hun Kang has, uh, is going to talk about a contemporary issue in the commons, which is a really interesting idea. And then going a little bit into the future, it's actually a partly real already, Hilda is going to talk about uh, her own idea. And I'm going to close it with a little discussion around Alaska. We were supposed to have uh, somebody from Alaska, but uh, he couldn't make it, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on in Alaska. I'm going to ask all the speakers to try and stay within about eight minutes so that with a little bit of overrun, we have time for a good solid chunk of time for questions. So in terms of the commons and what are the commons? If you think about the origins of humanity, it started with sort of communities of hunter-gatherers who were strictly egalitarian. And those were essentially the origins of the commons. Over time, the concept of private property has in a sense been carved out of the larger commons. And if you think about something like intellectual property, even something like William Shakespeare's plays, which clearly none of us can ever reproduce, there is an idea that even this kind of intensely personal property reverts to the commons. So the commons is actually, in a sense, a superset of all private property. And I'm going to leave it now from this point to Carl to take this idea forward and uh, talk about his uh, thoughts. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're giving me a handheld mic. That's dangerous, because now I can, I can wander around and pace. I am going to argue that we need to have a different way of looking at the commons than is typical. Uh, and I'm, I call it, we should be viewing the commons as the people's endowment. And we should be maximizing the value of the people's endowment, which is the total commons. And we should be maximizing the real value of that endowment, not the financial value of that endowment. The financial value is one component of the real value of that endowment, but the full value of it includes its value as it is, as an environment, as a commons, as a way to something that we can use as it is, as the environment that sustains us. This environment that we're destroying we're destroying the environment that sustains us as we live, and we have to look at what is this, can this environment provide for us and for future generations. This endowment model, uh, it mostly contrasts with the way we are treating resources now, the way most governments have been treating resources throughout history, which is to use them and privatize them on an ad hoc basis and giving them to cronies for free and letting those uh, now wealthy people who control the environment sell them back to us at the full market value. So they get them for free or nearly free from the government. They sell them back to us uh, at full market value. They might add value along the way, but they're capturing not just the value they add, they are capturing the full market value of the resource itself. It's like getting a gift from the government and then selling that gift back to the people who are supposed to own the government. Now, uh, I would also like to contrast it. This objection to that ad hoc method has been around for a very long time, and it's in its most familiar form is the uh, sometimes called a left libertarian idea of saying, well, let's, we should have an equalize the value the dollar value of the rents on the commons. And uh, I think that is a good start, but it makes the question look much more simple than it is. And the complexities of the question actually are great opportunities for us, the people who own our great endowment. Because it's to, to say that, well, there's a fixed amount of resources, you auction them all off, and then you split the money is to say, well, 
uh, is, to, is to treat it as very simplistic, when in fact there are many things you can do with resources. Uh, there are three main things. You can leave them as a commons for everyone's use or no one's ownership. Leave them in the environment or make parks out of them or something like that. Or make thoroughfares out of them. All of those are forms of commons. You can make them into public property, which is different than a common property. A school, a publicly owned hospital, a library. This is a specific public use that all people, only people who are eligible to, to, for that use would use it. Only a heart patient can go into the heart surgery room. Only a fourth grader can go into the fourth grade school. So, so that's very different than a commons. You can use it for that way, or you can privatize it. But even sim the simple act of privatizing it is not as cut and dried and straightforward as this idea of let's just split the rental value. It is, it is on what terms do we privatize it? If you, were if you privatize a space by the river and say you can dump all the pollutants you want into the river, it sells at one price. If you say privatize it, you say we're going to privatize it, but we're going to restrict and not let you dump anything into the river, it sells at another price. We have all these different sorts of regulations. If we privatize it permanently, it sells at one price. If we privatize it on a five-year lease, it sells it at, it sells for another price. All these different ways we can privatize it are uh, something that makes the, endow the value and the money we get out of the endowment different. But also, another thing is that makes it more complex is that we don't have to sell the profit-maximizing amount of resources. We can, ma we can maximize our profit out of it, but we can hold extra resources back because we want a bigger commons. We want a bigger and better environment. And as you hold them back, you can get a higher price for them. And we can negotiate the price between those of us who are more sellers and those of us who are more buyers. So what I see is, the, I, the basic income as I see it, is a two-way street. It's a reciprocal. There's, there's, some, there's, there's this argument floating around that basic income is, some, is somehow a violation of a principle of reciprocity, that everyone should be treated the same. Uh, it's the very opposite is true, is that a society without basic income violates reciprocity. Because as I see this with the endowment model, is that you pay for what you take from the commons, and you receive for what everybody else took, took out of the commons. When I privatize something out of the commons, I'm making it unavailable for you. So I pay on that, and I obey the regulations that you set on that, and that finances the basic income for everyone else. And we're negotiating the price of this so that uh, hopefully the buyers and the sellers will be happy with it. Now, if you think of our endowments, if you think of the resources that we share and you compare uh, as an endowment and you compare that to just about any other endowment, you can see that our governments are horrible custodians of, of our endowments. Compare the U.S. government endowment uh, compare, uh, to Harvard's endowment. Harvard's a bit older than the U.S. government, but the U.S. government appears in 1776 and uh, gets ownership of a big chunk of the continent. Uh, and it's uh, a little nefarious how we got the ownership, but uh, they have a bunch of stuff. And they've been privatizing it for all these years. And what do they have to show for it? Their ownership has just shrunk and shrunk and shrunk, and they have no portfolio of money that they've gathered from shrinking this. Whereas, take Harvard University. They started with a few hundred pounds uh, of, that was a type of money back then. Uh, and now they have something like $50 billion and uh, uh, hundreds of buildings and thousands of acres of land. They just keep getting bigger. And the, the commons owned by the U.S. government uh, that's not privatized just keeps shrinking and the stuff that we own together keeps getting worse because we're letting people pollute it for free. Because we're stupid with our endowment and Harvard is smart with their endowment. So the idea is we just start treating our commons like a real endowment. And I think my time is up. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Carl, for staying very much on time. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Guy to come up next. Thank you very much. There's no one more boring than someone who's just published a book on the subject on which he's about to talk, so I have to appreciate you being uh, tolerant. In a sense, this book, Plunder of the Commons, 
complete a set of books that I've been writing over the past decade that began with the Precariat, then the Precariat Charter, and then Rentier Capitalism. And I felt that the Commons and the articulation of how it's been plundered was the final bit in the jigsaw of my own personal story. I don't think I'll go into the definitions of the the commons, but it's very important that we do have definitions. And I think that the, the essence of the book is that it divides the commons into five types. The natural commons, the social commons, the inherited amenities, social facilities, institutions, the civil commons, the common law, the common in law institutions, the cultural commons that we have as built up over the, the, our lifetime and many previous lifetimes, and what I call the knowledge com commons, which is information, ideas, and education. And I think that it's important to look at how each of those types of commons have been built up through history and how each has been plundered. And although I spoke, I gave a keynote uh, at the Lisbon Bien Conference, where I traced basic income back to the Charter of the Forest of 1217, that charter was actually the charter that first established the commons and common rights and a right to subsistence as part of being in the commons. And it's a very important part of my narrative tracing forward from the Charter of the Forest. And a second very important inspiration of the work, if that's the correct word, was what's known as the Lauderdale Paradox of 1804, which puzzled numerous classical economists, but has gone out of favor with neoclassical economics. The essential claim of Lauderdale was that as private riches increase, public wealth declines. And that's primarily because private rich people essentially take the commons, limit the commons, and create contrived scarcity of common resources that had been part of the commons. I haven't got time to go into the detail of that, but it's part of the narrative of my analysis. Now, if you think of how the commons have been plundered, have been taken, have been stolen, have been uh, given or whatever, you essentially think of encroachment, gradually taking without any, without any permission to do so, enclosure, which has been the traditional way, social forgetting, which is very important historically, very important, how some commons existed as a commons for generations, but gradually the social memory of their existence disappears. The neglect, the commodification, the privatization of the commons, all of these things that I was writing about in each of the five types of commons, and then suddenly halfway through writing the book, I realized actually the number one issue today is the colonization of the commons. Increasingly, the, column, the commons of all types are being colonized by multinational capital and particularly by financial capital. And I hadn't realized before writing the book and doing all the research for the book just how extensive that colonization is. Now, the essence of the book is to propose a commons charter. It has 44 articles, and the last two articles are that we should establish a permanent commons fund in which all levies on intrusions of commons should be paid and built up in, into a permanent sovereign wealth fund, if you like. And it's very interesting how you can actually construct that with a series of levies on intrusions into the different types of commons. And when I describe each of those individually to audiences, 
they say, damn right, that should be done. It's very interesting because you have to go to a fairly low level of, of abstraction where you actually identify how a particular commons has been taken away and why we should have compensation for the commoners for that particular intrusion. Now, the interesting thing is if you say that a good society is one that gives precedence to public wealth over private riches, then obviously we should have a strategy for rejuvenation of the commons, for a recovery of the commons, and for compensating the commoners for the loss of the commons. And you can only do that if you accept the principle that every one of us is an equal commoner and therefore every one of us should be equally compensated without any particular group given priority or any selective strategy by a government to favor this interest, that interest. And it's that justification of a commons fund and common dividends, you can see where we're going with the story, is actually built up. And what I've done in the book is taken the British case where you can have levies on intrusions of the different types of commons to build up a commons fund in which you can very quickly have enough resources in the fund to be able to pay out common dividends, which are a decent basic income. But you have to respect a key principle, which is known as the Hartwick rule of intergenerational equity. Raoul mentioned it yesterday. And it's a very important rule because basically it is that you should invest resource rents. So if you're using a commons that is an asset, you have to preserve the asset's value for future generations as well as for the current generations. So you can only distribute the return on investment of resources mobilized from that particular asset, commons asset, like a minerals, like certain uh, exhaustible resources. So you have to treat that type of commons as a capital, and that means you can't recycle all the income that you would raise from whatever levy you have. You have to put it into the fund, invest it, and only the net return can you use to distribute as common dividends. But fortunately, and this is where I'm going to have to stop because of running out of time, fortunately, most levies on most intrusions of the commons are not exhaustible commons. If you think of something like water, water in many countries, including my own, has been privatized. The privatization of water has led to a shortage of water because the privatized companies have taken rental profits, loaded the companies with debt, not done any maintenance, poured sewage into the rivers, so none of our rivers are swimmable. You can't go into any English river these days in a, in a healthy condition. You don't risk it. And they've made huge profits, but the income has gone up. Now, a levy on water, which should be a fairly big one, because it's a foreign-owned private equity ownership of water, is something that you can say, yes, that can be recy recycled as dividends, because it is something that is going to continue as an asset. And many of the other levies that I've proposed in the book are on certain things like billboard levy, like a frequent flyer levy, which are polluting and are regressive, because taking the commons is a regressive phenomenon, where you can actually catch the levy and recycle as equal dividends, and it's going to be a progressive strategy. Now, I've had to rush through a whole very complex set of arguments, and I'm going to regret afterwards saying this bit and not that bit, but I hope that the, uh, the orientation of seeing the commons and the recovery of the commons as a legitimation of a basic income strategy. 
And I think the young in particular get it because essentially it's grounded in an environmental, ecological perspective. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Guy. Uh, that was extremely interesting. I haven't yet read the book, so I really look forward to reading that. I just had a couple of comments uh, just right up. And the Lauderdale paradox links very well to what Carl was saying. Because if we restrict the amount of commons we privatize, we actually increase the value, which is using the Lauderdale paradox to our benefit as opposed to the opposite. In terms of the plunder, I recently looked at the UK. So if you look at from about the 1700s when there was really sort of not much debt and the UK owned what it did, uh, since then it has got all the fruits of colonization it has finished off basically most of its coal as well as the North Sea oil. So you'd expect the government to have an extremely large fund, but it turns out the IMF stated like just last year that the UK government's you know, projected out balance sheet brought down to today is a negative 125% of GDP. So the UK government has been a wealth-destroying machine despite whatever you might think about it. And the last point I also just want to make is that if you think about the loss of the commons, it's basically imposing a per head tax on everybody out here, taking money away equally from everybody, which is the inverse of what we're all talking about. We want to give money to everybody, but by allowing plunder, we're actually allowing ourselves a negative basic income. Okay, now uh, Mr. Kang is going to come up with an extremely interesting idea. Do listen. I will talk about common health basic income and common good basic income. As I said yesterday, Andrew Young's uh, 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 promises three kinds of basic income. Uh, one is freedom dividend, uh, $1,000 per month to uh, everybody. Uh, and the second is carbon dividend. And the third one is the democracy dollars. Uh, it's 100 democracy dollars uh, to every, everyone uh, for each federal election cycle. It's a kind of voucher that they can use to support candidates of their choosing. Uh, this is from the website of Andrew Yang. We need to diminish the influence of the mega wealthy individuals and companies have in our elections. Uh, to do so, we must make it possible for all Americans to contribute to candidates they feel strongly about in order to drown out the voices of the few who can spend millions of dollars to influence our politicians. So this is the uh, uh, essence of the, uh, this policy, democracy dollars. It's different from participation income. You cannot use it for yourself, but should give it to others. Uh, it is also different from ordinary basic income. It's the money that can only be used to support candidates. And the purpose of this basic income is not to guarantee real freedom, but to guarantee real and equal participation in representative democracy. We need another category of basic income, I think. So I, I like to say the ordinary a basic income as uh, Commonwealth basic income. It's universal, unconditional, individual. It's money, full money, and the amount may vary with age. The purpose is to guarantee real freedom for all. The rationale is we are all common owners of a common wealth. And the another category is common good basic income. Here, common good means the purpose of politics in classics, or sometimes politics itself. It's universal, unconditional, and individual, uh, but money restrictions to support political agents. The amount must be the same. The purpose is to guarantee real and equal participation for all in the discussion of common good. Rational is we are all sovereign citizens of political society. Next one. Uh, this is political uh, dividend. That, uh, the next one, this is Andrew Young's Democratic Dallas. 
And the another form of common good basic income can be media dividend. And the idea is already in these books. Uh, media capture, rich elite capture the media. Uh, media, uh, in case of Korea, political distribution of citizens is left 30%, middle 30, right 40. But political distribution of the media is left only 10%, middle 10%, right 80%. So, one person, one dollar, give everyone the same amount of money that they can use to support the media. Media dividend can change the political distribution of the media without violating freedom of the press. Next one. Yeah, uh, this, these are examples of Commonwealth ordinary basic incomes. I will uh, only uh, name the title. Uh, if you, you have questions I will explain later. Uh, one is land dividend. Next one. Uh, the other is carbon dividend. Uh, last one. Yeah, uh, last one is knowledge dividend. Thank you. Thank you. As, uh, that was extremely interesting. Thanks very much. Um, it's nice to see universal basic income being considered in a way to actually impact our real deep political problems of so thanks for that and now moving on to a little bit further into the future already real over to you Hilda. Good afternoon everyone and thank you for having me on this exciting panel. My name is Hilda Latour, I'm a board member of the Dutch Basic Income Movement and co-founder of Mission Possible 2030, a foundation linking the sustainable development goals to basic income. But in the first place, I'm a single mum of two beautiful daughters and I work as hard as I can to co-create a better future for them and their children. And I tend to see the commons as something like the air you breathe. The air is not owned by anyone. I can inhale as deeply as I want to. I can use as much oxygen as I need from it. But I cannot prevent you to inhale the air in this room. Nor can I make you pay me for it. I cannot put the air in a bag, walk away with it, and leave you behind in a vacuum. You may need more oxygen than I do, for whatever reason, and that is fine. No questions asked. Some say there is a tragedy of the commons, and there is, although I prefer to speak of a tragedy in the commons. We are dealing with severe exploitation of human and natural resources. We face severe pollution of land, waters and the air. Our mother is terminally ill because of a system that has created monsters and she's going to throw us out. The situation on Earth is so bad that the ultra-ultra-rich, instead of providing a basic income for humanity, which they can easily afford, the ultra-ultra-rich are preparing their escape to Mars. Brave. Very brave. Well, crowds will gather to wave them off and I will join them. I don't want to live on Mars. It doesn't attract me at all. Let the ultra-ultra-rich go as soon as possible. I'm staying here with the ordinary people, the people with common sense. By nature, we are a caring species. If we are not in the survival mode and backed by a basic income, we will take care of our mother. We unite, take turns and work together. We pick up the pieces, we plant the trees, and we take care of ourselves and our surroundings. There is a tragedy in the commons, and much of it has to do with unjust ownership in a capitalist society that focuses on consumption, increase of debt, and inflation. It is amazing what power in a fear-based society does to people. Even poverty has become a business model. Ownership of land, real estate, water, energy, transport, money, and even intellect is absurd when you think about it. It is based on competition, on exclusion of others, an I win, you lose mentality. But in the end, we will all lose, and we know it. Optimism is our task, however, 
and the only way forward. Anything else is paralyzing. But time is running out fast. Time has come to rebuild the commons on a large scale and save the planet and ourselves. So let's have a look on the bright side. Okay, 90% of the wealth generated in 2018 went to 1% of the people and the gap between the ultra-rich and the poor is growing faster than we've ever seen before. But the good news is 90% is a lot of money and enough to live on if shared between all of us. More and more wealth is generated with the help of technology, replacing human labor. But the technologies of today and tomorrow also enable us to think and act very differently. If we build the machines and we program the algorithms for the world of tomorrow, then we can decide what our world of tomorrow will look like. We can redesign the future ourselves and do something radically different. So let's get out of our comfort zone. It's not comfortable anymore anyway. I would like to share a little story. Once upon a time, Paul, an artist, and his friend Max, a computer programmer, bought a piece of forest. They called it Terra Zero, and they wanted to investigate if a forest can own and utilize itself. And they started coding on the blockchain. They programmed a smart contract, which is a set of rules programmed into code. And this contract stated that the non-human actor, the computer program, the forest, could buy TerraZero shares from Paul and Max, so-called tokens, registered on the blockchain. Another smart contract orders a satellite image from TerraZero every six months. A computer program analyzes the image and defines the trees that can be harvested without damaging the forest too much. Then the forest starts trading. Licenses to cut the trees are sold. And with the money that comes in, the computer program starts to buy TerraZero tokens from Paul and Max. Once payment is complete, Paul and Max hold no more tokens. The forest has become the sole shareholder of its own economic unit. The forest, in economic terms, controls itself and can start trading on its own. Paul, Max and TerraZero really exist. TerraZero is a piece of forest 30 kilometers east of Berlin. Now, basic income was not a theme in this experiment, but once a forest is the sole shareholder of its own economic unit, something really interesting happens. Because now we have a forest taking care of itself, selling its own trees. Money comes in, but it has no urge to keep it. Unlike most humans, the forest has no intrinsic motivation to earn money and accumulate wealth. So we can program it to buy more forest from human owners who are willing to sell. And we can also program it to distribute part of the surplus to the people as a basic income. How cool is that? A forest taking care of itself, selling its own trees and giving us a basic income. Fantastic. And why stop here? Why not have ownerless solar panels, drinking water facilities, houses, cars? What if we build infrastructures of electric cars in the commons that generate value and distribute it as a basic income? Ownership is so not futuristic. Many people already understand that it is much better not to own a car as long as there is one available when you need it. People will pay a small fee, which will be lower than what we're used to because no profit-based companies are involved. The money that comes in can be used, to for, used for maintenance, growth, and to integrate new technologies. And of course, part of the surplus is used to distribute a basic income to all citizens, including the non-users, an unconditional basic income, and all fully automated. 
The technology will be open source, ac accessible to everyone, no intellectual property, but it will be licensed for non-commercial use. So let's free the machines from their human owners. Let's liberate them and make them part of the commons. Let them generate value and distribute a basic income to all of us. Thank you, Hilda, for that uh, really exciting idea of, um, for the automation world or for the world of the future. Uh, I'm happy that I'm chairing the session so I don't have to give the same talk I gave a couple of days ago. But I do want to talk a little bit about two, uh, two things relating to the commons. The first is if you think about it, uh, most of the basic incomes that we, which we know of and sort of we can talk about Alaska, Iran, Mongolia, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Macau, uh, they are all sort of intrinsically based a little bit on a commons uh, dividend kind of an approach. Now, of, uh, but if you extend the idea and you look at commons all over the world that do pay dividends, there would actually be hundreds and thousands of them. Uh, cooperators, for instance, I just looked it up, there are 2.6 million cooperators in the world and many of them do pay dividends. Uh, so, I would say that, or I would suggest that the actual number of real basic incomes in the form of citizen dividend is much more than the six that we know of. And actually there are many, many of these already in existence. And uh, one thing is we should probably go out and document and find, you know, investigate where these dividends exist. The second part I want to talk about really is Alaska. Now, a lot of the conversation today has been about how do we get a basic income in place. Alaska is facing a different question. They have a basic income in place. How do they protect it? How do they defend it? And it is under great threat. Over the last four years, the politicians have been trying for the third time, actually, to take this dividend away. And the reason they're doing, the reason they're bringing is that there's this huge budget deficit and we need to get money from somewhere and we own the dividend, so let's use the dividend to pay for the budget of the university. Now, the problem is, you know, if it's so hard to get a basic income in place and if we can't defend it, then, you know, it's sort of almost a pointless exercise. Uh, but, and there is a significant framing issue going on in Alaska which all of us need to understand how the politics is being played and how the discourse is being manipulated to try and take this dividend away. So here's what's happened in Alaska. About 20% of the money they were getting from the oil was going into the permanent fund and the remaining 80% was going into the budget and was being called revenue, income that could be spent as opposed to capital that had to be invested or saved. So naturally the government is, okay, let's get more and more income so that we can do one of three things. We can reduce taxes, create subsidies, or maybe we do some investments of which the politicians, you know, a lot of places have missed a 10%, they can take a cut and use that again to get reelected. So the politicians love it. So in 2013, at the peak of the China boom, the money that was coming into the Alaska budget had gone up to $8 billion. At the bottom of the boom, it went down to $3 billion. Now, when it was at $8 billion, you can imagine there are enough politicians here, you don't want to leave money unspent, so this expenditure in Alaska went up to $8 billion. $3 billion, how do you now bridge the budget? Initially, they started using up a variety of reserve funds that they had built up, but all of that is pretty much spent. So they now have four essential choices in front of them. Cut spending. I mean, politicians don't like cutting spending because you're going to lose votes. When they had introduced this whole, uh, when they started extracting oil and getting revenue into the budget, Alaska removed their income taxes they could reintroduce an income tax into Alaska. Not very palatable. 
especially in the US where Republicans are under an enormous pressure from a particular NGO called Americans for Tax Relief. So no Republican in the US, no Republican in the US wants to vote for a tax increase. So income tax is sort of not even on the table. It's actually gone out of the Overton frame of thinking as a possibility. What's left? You can increase the amount that Alaska gets for the oil. There's enough studies to show that Alaska gets approximately half of what they should get for their oil if you compare it to Alaska. Or Conoco Phillips, who's, one, who's the main extractor, says that Alaska is by far their most profitable oil um, extraction site. But what's happening is royalty is being called an oil tax. It's not a compensation for the mineral. So the compensation for the mineral, everybody will say, okay, you know, we're getting 50% of what we should, let's increase it to 100. But when it's called an oil tax, the public, no, 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 don't raise taxes on anybody. And the Republicans, of course, are not voting for an oil tax. So that's also off the table. What's the fourth thing they can do? Go after the permanent fund dividend today, and once the dividend is finished, then they'll go after the permanent fund corpus. But like I explained, if you're taking the permanent fund dividend, you're actually imposing a per head tax on everybody. But it's not called a per head tax. It's called, we're using it in the budget. So the Republicans are happy to vote for it, even though this is actually the most regressive tax possible. I mean, if you know a little bit of history, Margaret Thatcher essentially was kicked out of power when she tried to impose a per head tax. But this is imposing a per head tax in stealth. So let's go back to the four options. Cut expenditure, raise the compensation for the oil, introduce an income tax, or impose a per head tax on the people. If you look at it in this frame, clearly you want to increase the amount you're getting for the oil. You may want to cut spending a little bit. You may want to introduce an income tax or possibly even a sales tax or a VAT. Cutting the dividend will actually be the last option. But this is the impact of framing, and this is why Alaska is struggling to retain really the only real UBI that we're all sort of looking to. So I just wanted to explain this because, you know, we're looking at the first step of the problem, but if we don't think about the second step, we can get a basic income, but we will probably lose it if we don't look at how this whole political conversation is going on. So with that, let me stop and throw the floor open for questions. Uh, and I can see already some hands going up. Uh, let me just see. I want to ask uh, uh, Professor Kang uh, about the brilliant idea of a ba the common good basic income. Uh, but I have a slight reservation because uh, it's not basic income. Uh? Uh, uh, so, it's vouchers. So, what about uh, calling it common good vouchers or some other terms rather than calling it common good basic income? Yeah. So, uh, that's my question. Oh, uh, well, obviously, uh, thanks. You've uh, made it clear that I, I didn't explain myself clearly enough. Is that uh, we don't uh, we don't all get a, a voucher for, uh, for these resources. Uh, what resources we do privatize... Not about the commonwealth basic income, but democracy dollars and the media dividend, uh, those... Uh, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Vouchers, I was vouchers can be exclusively used to support political party or candidates or to support the media. Uh, so uh, it's vouchers, but uh, so uh, uh, so you distinguish between commonwealth uh, basic income and the common good basic income. But the uh, common good basic income could be rather termed as c common good vouchers. So that's my question. Okay, I'll think about it uh, more. Uh, uh, I respect your opinion, but for me, the name is not important. Only the policy is important. 
but uh, in my opinion right now, uh, it is uh, more desirable uh, to call them basic income because many people, uh, we make, we should make many people like basic income. Uh, that's my opinion, but I think about it, yeah. Uh, I'm Rinya from Palatsky University. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is about the concept of commons. Um, I'm wondering where is the border of the commons? Are we talking about the global level or national level or city level or even narrower? And the second question is related to the first one. What I'm observing now is that the commons proposals about the dividends are more on the regional level. And for example, in the process of China's urbanization, some villagers saw their collective land to developers. And then those uh, villagers who have their land located in the better places got more land dividend uh, than those who, who's who land are located in, in the more suburb or worse places. And so this led me to the question, how do we ensure this um, equal compensation or equal commoners? Uh, Guy Standing just mentioned uh, in his speech. Thank you. Uh, can you raise your hands again, please? Uh, right there, another lady. Sometimes I wonder with the basic income movement whether we understand or that, we're really, that, that we really think about how much power we're going to need to institute all these good ideas, and uh, yeah, and what do you think about that? Uh, thank you, just two questions. Um, why don't we tax the 1.4 quadrillion derivatives market? 1% of it will produce something like 7 trillion, I, want, I mean 14 trillion right away. And second is to Hilda, can we redesign the Alaska Fund in the manner by which you described it a while ago through blockchain? That's all. Thank you. Okay. Should we start with Hilda since you've got the last question and let everybody answer what they want? Um, let me first respond to Bob's question. How much power for good ideas do we need? Um, Never underestimate the power of the seed. Uh, my experience is that if you plant the seed of these kind of ideas that I am now preaching for a while, with young people that are working on the blockchain, and they go, they just go, they form groups, and they, um, I, I don't, I don't even, I can't, I can't even follow follow them in their speed. So, um, the power of the seed is the most powerful. Um, uh, impact that we can have. Then the question about if we could redesign Alaska funds. <laughs> um, well, not as it is now, I suppose, because there's capital earning interest through investments in a, in my opinion, very ill system. So, I think we should, you know, these, these fossil energies will, will have to be forbidden. And uh, we should just design a new system on the side. Uh, let, me, let me begin with the first question addressed to me about national and international uh, commons. Uh, i give you an example of a national commons in my own country. The Crown Estate, that's the monarchy, has just decided it's going to auction off our seabed. All the seabed around Britain, bits of it are going to be put up for auction and Shell and a Norwegian company and a few other foreign companies are buying up long leases to bits of our seabed and seashore. That's because it's part of our national commons. It's completely illegitimate that out of that sale, the crown estate, the monarchy, is going to make several billion pounds. 
It's complete robbery from the commons. If I explain that to students or young activists at any part of the country, they will get it that that is improper and a theft from the commons. Okay, you can do that with a lot of things. But now let me give you a scary international commons issue, which I've mentioned in the book, which is about the blue commons. Without us realizing, much of the oceans of the world are being privatized and commodified through intellectual property rights. And one company has acquired 47% of all the patents on marine species and marine processes around the globe. And it's been authorized by the World Trade Organization and TRIPS. So that one company has 47% of the patents. And three countries between them have 76% of the intellectual property rights that have been established in the global oceans. That means that the rest of us are essentially shut out of what we thought was part of the global commons. Think about the implications going forward. Three countries can dominate. One company, which happens to be a German company, has all those patents. That intellectual property is taking the ideas, the knowledge commons, and privatizing it and colonizing it because it's multinationals that are dominating the intellectual property rights. So for me, this is an area where the next question I'm going to respond to, which is how are we going to get the power to actually do something about it? I think that in many instances of where commons are being taken away, once you articulate what has been happening, then a lot of people across classes become motivated to want to vote for something to be done about it. And the instance in a number of countries that is, it does get a lot of anger going is what's called POPs, which is an, a, a, an acronym for privately owned public spaces. We just don't realize how much of our cities and our towns have been privatized. Iconic marketplaces, iconic squares, large parts of London that we think are public and that were built many generations ago are now owned by Malaysian or Chinese or American or Abu Dhabi property companies. And this loss of the commons is something that a lot of people say that is illegitimate and we want compensation. So I believe that once we articulate at the, at the level, not of abstract level, but at the level of instances of all these things, then we can mobilize very quickly a, a big opposition to the theft of the commons. Thank you. I think I'll pick it up at the point of power just from my personal experience in sort of we're working on mining and we're asking for essentially the rent seeking and crony capitalism to stop and you would think that that's all that's like one of the most difficult things to do. But uh, to Hilda's point, once you articulate it, that is your starting point and we've had considerable success. We actually have a permanent fund under a court order. We have a cap on extraction in Goa. India's national mineral policy has this line, I'm not sure if some of you weren't there, but I'll just repeat that. It says, natural resources, including minerals, are a shared inheritance uh, where, the, uh, where the state is a trustee on behalf of the people to ensure future generations receive the benefit of their inheritance. Now, this has happened because we asked for it. If we hadn't asked for it, nothing would have happened. But we have asked for it, and this is a massive step forward, which if you sort of went back a year, you would think it was just impossible to get. So asking is a big step, and once you've got it in one place, now it's up to all of us to carry it forward to other places. 
Uh, just on a cup on uh, derivatives, I've actually been a, a forex market trader and have actually done derivatives. The moment you start introducing a, for, uh, a transactions tax or a derivatives tax, the volumes that are traded will shrink dramatically, which is a good thing, but the amount that you will actually collect will go down dramatically. Uh, and lastly, redesigning the permanent fund as a sort of a self-regulating mechanism, it may be possible if you design it as an index fund, which is a passive investment, but there are now issues coming up with too many, too much money being invested passively, and it has further consequences on the viability of the investment. So uh, it, we'll have to look at it deeper in more technical terms. And now let me see if Carl or Nan. Okay, let me, uh, uh, I, I noted down a couple of things to talk about. One, one more question, somebody asked, what is the commons, and uh, how do you define the border between uh, the commons and what is not the commons? The commons is anything, any asset, any resource, any object, uh, any piece of matter um, or energy that is for the use of everyone, but the property of no one. So once, the entire world was a comet. Before somebody started staking the land and saying, this is mine and I'm gonna keep you off, the entire world was a comet. That's a, a well-established history. Um, and it really wasn't until the last few centuries that the majority of the world's land area switch from becoming a commons to either public or private property. But the commons, the border between the commons and uh, private or publicly owned assets is very hard to define because it's not just geographical or spatial. The atmosphere remains a commons. We can all use it, but none of us so far have successfully gained ownership over the whole thing. It's really a one thing. But it is being, in a non-spatial way, partially privatized every day. As, as companies, and me and you, whenever we drive our cars, um, pollute that atmosphere, uh, for everyone else, we make the commons less valuable for everyone who uses it. So the border, so uh, uh, there's parts of the privatized commons in my lungs right now, little bits of tar that I have breathed in that have stuck to my lungs thanks to the, thanks to the plunder of the commons that's been doing sort of a negative way. Rather than taking out some good thing from the commons, they put in some bad things from their private stuff. So the border between what is the commons and what is not the commons is very complex. Okay, now our other question is about the power that we need to put these ideas into place. We live in, most of us live in countries that are supposed to be democracies. And they are extremely far short of being a democracy. And I think there's a deeper, more important fight about the people really taking control of their governments and their democracy. And an enormous amount of power has to come just for the people to take ownership of their governments. And then an enormous fight has to be done for people to figure out what is in the general interest of all the people and how can we be fair to those people who are a little different from the mainstream in the democracy. All of that requires a lot of thought and power and a big fight with entrenched interests. And I think we all have to specialize in what we're good at. And I learned a long time ago, I don't know how to organize people. I, I'm an idea guy, that's what I think I specialize in. Maybe it, if you find the ideas I come up with and the way they express useful uh, as you organize activism, uh, call me up. I'll be glad to help out. I do not lead activism. I don't know what activism works. I'm a follower when it comes to activism. Uh, so if you think, uh, if you think knowing my skill set, if you think there's anything I can do to help activism, let me know and I'll try to help out. But I leave that to you. 
Yes, uh, common good basic income is a simple, simple idea. Uh, uh, we, are, uh, we live in democracy, but uh, democracy uh, is not real because rich people have more influence, more power in politics. So not only one person, one vote is not enough for the real democracy. For real democracy, we need not only one person, one vote, but also one person, one dollar. Thank you. I, I, I'd just like to add to the question of um, ownership. It's, it's quite easy conceptually and theoretically when we come to the natural commons relative to the other types of commons the social, the civil, cultural, and the knowledge commons. And I've been doing quite a lot of historical research for the book, and I came to realize that, that vital importance of the social memory. And in, in the Middle Ages, if there was a commons of some amenity, some practice, some institution, they used to convene uh, an informal court. And if an elderly person could say that this had existed as a commons from time out of mind of man, was the expression of time out of mind of man. In other words, it had existed for longer than anybody could remember. And they translated that into common law, first of all, by relating it to some king who died. You know, if, you could, if it related to before that king died, then it was a commons. And then eventually it was codified and reduced to 20 years. And essentially, a commons in the social commons, like an institution, becomes a commons if it's not been contested for more than 20 years. So in a sense, the National Health Service in Britain became a commons in 1968, 20 years after it was set up. And it is a commons. And you can relate that very much to cultural institutions. I give one example, which some of you may know about. Henry Moore made a wonderful statue, huge statue, which is called Old Flow. It's a woman sitting draped, being clearly with her child. And because he was a socialist, he wanted to give it as a piece of cultural commons to a low-income area, a council estate, which he did in 1957. But then when austerity hit and the conservatives took over, they decided they were going to sell old flow. And it was going to sell for 20 million. Unfortunately, huge number of people protested that this is part of the commons. This is beautifying a low-income area and is part of our commons. The irony was that old flow was saved, but the estate was taken down. And old flow was moved from Tower Hamlets in London to Yorkshire for a while while they decided what to do with it. And then it's been brought back to London in a place called Canary Wharf, which is a pops for gentrified housing. So now it sits in a beautifying an already affluent area. So here you have a loss of the commons in a way that is very subtle, but is, is a real part of the plunder. And you can give countless examples of how we've been losing our commons in different ways. Thanks. Next round of questions. If money is part of the commons, and if it has been plundered, how should we get control back? Just a, a brief question of clarification about the relationship between what has been said and uh, basic income. It seems to me that uh, there are two possible relations with uh, uh, the a privatization of uh, the commons, or, or, or rather the first relationship is the following. At some point in history, 
uh, the commons, some commons are being privatized, and by way of compensation then, uh, the people who've been excluded from it are entitled to some sort of regular income by, um, that's the Fourier, Charles Fourier, Thomas Paine argument. The second argument uh, that seems to relate to some of the examples is rather that uh, some of what was previously common, op openly usable by anyone, is made public property. And then the public, the democratically elected uh, um, uh, government or whatever, decides to sell some of, for example, the rights to use the wavelengths uh, that are made uh, public property, and then the return on these publicly owned assets takes the form of a permanent dividend. And it seems to me, for example, that in the case of Goa, it's a matter of uh, making it clear that the, the mines or the minerals are the public, uh, are the, the, the property of the public, and then the sales of these uh, publicly owned resources then serve to create a fund uh, whose return is their forms and a basic income. And it seems, and it's not very clear to me how the various examples that have been given uh, fit into the first category, compensation for the commons, and that leads to the basic income, versus public ownership with a return that is then directly or indirectly serving to fund the basic income. So if there could be some clarification of that related to the question of what is exactly the commons, and that's something on which several have already commented usefully. Okay, uh, the money and banking question, um, uh, in, one, in, in a technical sense, that's, the, that's like the easiest, that's the easiest thing in a technical sense. Stop giving, stop giving stuff away to the, the private banking system. Uh, we... Uh, the government lends money at extremely low rates to private banks, um, lets them l lend it out at, uh, at market rates to everyone else. It insures them against virtually all risks and doesn't insure the rest of us against all risks. Just stop doing all those favors, whether you stop that by, uh, by interacting with the private banking system as a, a profit-maximizing central bank, or you just bypass the private banking system and become a public banking system. Either of those ways will work. There's other strategies that will work. Uh, now, in, and so in that technical sense, the how is really simple. That's easy. The other how question is the power question is how do you get the power over the banking system when these are some of the most powerful entrenched in, interests that control the government? And again, I don't know. That's not my field. We all specialize in different areas. You know, we do what we can. We got we got activists. We got academics from from a dozen different fields. We have non-academic writers. We have academic writers. We have we have artists. We have we have singers. All doing different things for part of this movement. We got to respect each other and the different efforts that we're all making. And hopefully, it'll all work. And uh, we'll do our best. And hopefully, yeah. so. Um a specific question, and I'm going to take the Goa example, and I'm not going to generalize it because I know the Goa example really well. So minerals, as far as the Indian constitution goes, uh, you know, my, you might have heard the five principles. First principle is uh, natural resources, including minerals owned by the state as a trustee for the people and especially future generations. So this is actually considered part of the constitution. And um, in the US, in Pennsylvania, so we make a distinction between property of the government and property which is held in trust by the government. And uh, so we're using that distinction, and it's actually been clarified in a judgment in Pennsylvania where there is a similar clause in their constitution. And when Pennsylvania has been extracting oil from the public lands, Somebody has gone to court and won an order from the Supreme Court saying that this money has to be used only for the purposes of the trust and not for the general public. Now, whether a trust is, part, is a commons or is it public property, again, I'm not entirely sure how you'd make that distinction, but we make the distinction between assets that are proprietary to the government and assets that are held in trust by the government. I hope that helps. I think in, in response to Philippe, I, uh, let me just say that most of my analysis is about the going from being a commons 
to being privatized, commodified, and colonized. And if I can give you just an, uh, a, a couple of examples. If you privatize water, as Margaret Thatcher did for all water in Britain, she not only privatized the water and the sewage system, but she gave the regional monopolies, which are all foreign owned, 424,000 acres of what had been common land. And what I'm proposing is not only that there should be some sort of mutual uh, public ownership, but there should be a levy on water use, levy on the profits, and levy on the land that they have, much of it which is unused. If you give another example, which is very uh, prevalent in the austerity era, hundreds and hundreds of libraries, public libraries, that were part of the commons way back into the 18th, 19th century, have been privatized and sold off. And clearly, there should be a levy on the fact that they have been taken by a private interest. And that's what I'm proposing. The same with the forests. We have a forestry commission, and the forestry commission, they attempted to privatize. It's the biggest landowner in Britain. It's the commons. They attempted to privatize. The public protest stopped the privatization of the forestry commission. Since then, they've been selling off to private interests thousands of acres of forestry land, which is part of the commons. And that is an illegitimate activity. And they've been privatizing the use of the forests to luxury tourist firms. And I'm saying there should be levies on all commercial uses of what were and what are our commons. But when you come to things like greenhouse gas emissions, which we are basically saying the commoners are being affected by toxic air. It's a regressive effect, and they should be compensated. And that is why we should have a levy, a greenhouse tax, whatever you want to call it, carbon tax and so on, which should be fed into the fund. And because you've got a fund that pays out equal common dividends, because we're all equal as commoners, Everybody should get an equal dividend paid from the fund. So that's the general line of, uh, of reasoning. If money is part of the commons and being plundered, how should we get control over that? Paul, you know how. You hit them where it hurts. You've been sitting on my porch like, for a couple of few nights after, after each other drinking a, a glass of beer, and you know how we should do that. Um, so if you want the answer to that, please go to Paul. I'll give, a, I'll give an, an abstract answer how I would like to see um, money being part of the commons. And that is an idea I, I, I was inspired by by my visit to Orville last week. And that is to see, to approach money really as a means of action and to see it as we do see electricity. And that means that you cannot hold on to it. With a future where money does not exist in a physical way anymore and everything is on the internet somewhere, we can actually approach money as if it were electricity. And then we build a smart grid and see where the money goes. And all the money is available for everyone who has an idea that is not refused by our circle of governance that has at least four women and three men in it. Then my very last remark about intellectual property, I think it was Martin Luther King who said, it is a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. Who cares intellectual property? Intellectual property does not exist. We have an, a collective consciousness. There is no intellectual property. So just ignore that. Thanks. Uh, we have to close. Uh, thank you all, Hilda, Guy, Carl, Nam, and uh, myself. And hopefully, uh, we'll we're going to have the catwalk now. Okay, I'm handing it over to Sarat to.
take the agenda. Thank you so much. Guy Stenning, you mentioned, and many others, to me as a Brazilian, your awareness about one of the most important commons that exists in Brazil, the, Bra the Amazon forestry. And uh, I want to, to tell you that I'm very worried about uh, the reactions of the President Jair Bolsonaro that uh, didn't, now he's saying, well, well, I'll put the army there to protect the forest, but in the, in the, in the two weeks ago, for two weeks, well, he said that he won't need any more the French, the Norway, the, the German funds that were given to Brazil to protect the forestry. And uh, so uh, I would like to thank you, your awareness about uh, now there are campaigns all, all over the world against Brazilian products because of the neglect of and you know that uh, a few days ago, the fire in the Brazilian forest was so grave that uh, being Sao Paulo, 2,500 kilometers from the forest, uh, uh, during the afternoon, some, the Sao Paulo became dark because of the, the smoke of the forest coming from the Amazon. So uh, this is something that it's a, it's a common, very important for humanity. So, and I just want to, to tell you a good news. Three weeks ago, I explained to the national movement of the street population, the population that live in the streets that has increased a lot in Sao Paulo and many other cities about what was the basic income. And they said, since they, uh, they concluded that it would be very good for them, they decided to write a letter to the president, Jair Bolsonaro, saying that they want the citizens' basic income to start immediately. And this is the voice of the street population, and I've just received a letter, a very well written two page letter that I will have it translated and give it to you, to, to the Bian uh, news flash, okay, to be published uh, in, re in a few days. Thank you very much. Okay. That was a fantastic panel. Thank you so much for all your efforts. Now we have a, we will close this session and the day's proceedings.